it's really quite a treat for me to be here today, uh, both to think about and to be part of a group of both domestic and international scholars, practitioners, and policymakers who are thinking very deeply about the importance of context, the importance of education, and the importance of poverty and poverty reduction in the fight against HIV AIDS, whether we do that work uh, domestically or globally, but I think in particular looking at Sub-Saharan Africa, which remains the world's most affected region, um, is incredibly important for us to come together um, and have the opportunity to dialogue with one another. And it's also a big treat for me to be able to follow um, Drs. McKay and Santelli. Um, I also graduated from Columbia. Their work has been incredibly important for my own thinking. Um, and I think it's a big treat for me to be part of a conference where the almighty Frank Zappa is invoked um, early in the day. Um, so I'm especially excited to introduce our first set of panelists to you who are going to be talking about working with HIV-positive children and adolescents in sub-Saharan Africa, the promise of family economic strengthening, or is there a promise? Um, so first, uh, we have Dr. Claude Mellons, who is a professor of clinical psychology in the Department of Sociomedical Sciences and Psychiatry at Columbia University. She is a clinical psychologist with research and clinical expertise in the psychosocial aspects of HIV AIDS among children and families at risk for and living with HIV AIDS. She's conducted research with children, mothers, and families affected by HIV AIDS in both the US and Africa. And her research has covered uh, incredibly important topics such as mental health, medication adherence, and the risk behavior needs, especially of youth. And she's also the co-founder and co-director of the Special Needs Clinic at New York Presbyterian Hospital, which is one of the first and the largest mental health clinics for women, children, and families living with HIV. And we are also uh, being joined by Dr. Gertrude Nachagoji, uh, who is the head of clinical services at the Rakai Health Sciences Program in Rakai, Uganda. Uh, in this role, she oversees the provision of HIV care and treatment to HIV-positive adults and children in the Rakai District, and she also works as a consultant at the International Center for Child, Health, and Asset Development Field Office in Masaka. She has a bachelor's degree in medicine and surgery from Makarere University Medical School and a master's degree in public health from Johns Hopkins, um, the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And our final panelist is Dr. Apollo Chavumbi, who is the study coordinator for the SUBI Adherence Study at Columbia University at the International Center for Child Health and Asset Development. Um, the, this study is funded by NICHD. Uh, Fred is the uh, PI. And it's evaluating the impact of an economic strengthening intervention on adherence to HIV treatment among adolescents living in poverty. Dr. Chavumbi is located in the Masaka, Uganda field office and holds a bachelor's degree in human medicine and human surgery from Makarere University Medical School in Kampala. So please uh, welcome me and uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you. really good thing I wore heels today. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, especially since Fred asked me to talk about everything I know about HIV-infected children and adolescents in 15 minutes. Fortunately for you, as uh, Mary McKay said, I'm from New York. Um, I promise not to talk too fast, um, and I'm going to try and get through as much as I can. But it's a real pleasure to be here to talk about a population of young people many of us thought would never survive infancy and childhood. As many of you know, the global pediatric HIV epidemic in countries with long-standing access to antiretroviral treatment and significant healthcare resources has become an adolescent and young adult epidemic. This is due to significant medical advances that have allowed us to prevent mother-to-child transmission of HIV and thus new cases, and it has also prolonged the lives of those already infected. So in the US, um, the majority of youth now who are born with HIV are way over the age of 13. Unfortunately, in many countries with more limited resources, as we're going to hear throughout this day, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, these efforts came late or have been difficult with hundreds of thousands of babies born with HIV. As treatment scale-up becomes more available, they too will reach adolescents in staggering numbers, and my talk today is going to focus on their needs, the few interventions that are out there, um, and where I think we need to go. 
So where is the epidemic now? UNAIDS estimates there are 3.4 million children under 15 years of age living with HIV, the vast majority perinatally infected and in sub-Saharan Africa. There are 2 million adolescents between the ages of 10 and 19 living with HIV. Globally, these, families are, uh, these children are most often from vulnerable families affected by poverty, violence, limited health care, and educational resources. They've experienced disruptions in caregiving due to a variety of factors, including parental illness and death. In some countries, parental substance abuse and untreated mental illness have decimated families. And in many countries, youth with perinatal HIV are born into families who've experienced racism and discrimination and now must cope with HIV-related stigma. So for many years, our research on HIV-positive adolescents has mainly focused on risk outcomes and prevention of HIV transmission to others and treatment non-inherence. And while understanding risk is important, uh, sorry, <laughs> for under, uh, identifying problems or targeting vulnerable populations, it doesn't tell us how. So in other areas, investigators have focused on resilience, that is, children who despite great adversity have successful outcomes, and understanding pathways to resilience has been helpful to us in defining the components of interventions most likely to promote positive youth development. So a risk and resilience combined, combined framework may be critical for informing much needed interventions for HIV positive youth, but that said, risk and resilience can imply something exceptional, and sometimes we lose sight of the everyday tasks and goals that are part of normative development. So to help us shift frameworks, this is an image of a board game called Life. How many of you know Life? Okay, this is a typical American board game in which the goal is to move around the board and reach the end with the most points, money, or life accomplishments. The game is meant for players that are as young as nine. You start the game as a young adult with a car and travel the path of life to a successful adulthood. You can go to school, get a job, find a spouse, find a place to live, have some kids, and if all goes well, end up, I think it's moving by itself, end up with a home, a family, and a successful career. So the game has a subtle way of helping children establish expectations of adult life and to how you make choices, and to have a future orientation. So these are three domains that all adolescents must contend with and take responsibility for as they transition to adulthood. However, normative adolescent risk-taking in these domains can have particular consequences for adolescents who've grown up with HIV. The transition from adult supervision to youth supervision of health care often leads to inadequate antiretroviral treatment adherence and poor retention and care, which in turn can lead to HIV disease progression. As youth become sexually active, which is normative, high risk or unsafe sex can lead to HIV transmission to partners, and in the context of poor adherence, risk for transmission of drug-resistant virus, it can also lead to pregnancy and transmission to babies. And substance use, um, particularly excessive substance use, can further accelerate risky sexual relations, poor adherence, and HIV disease progression. So perhaps the game of life is not so easy for perinatally infected youth with many potential obstacles, as shown here in this image from actually a Ugandan intervention that uses a similar framework entitled the safari of life, where youth must navigate obstacles such as drugs or violence or unintended pregnancy to successfully reach adulthood. So what are the challenges or obstacles uh, for perinatally infected youth biomedically? Globally, there are considerable health problems. In the US, many of these youth were born before there were optimal regimens. In other countries, particularly low resource settings, they were either identified late or had delayed access to treatment, all leading to health complications. And we all know there are many toxicities associated with the treatment itself. Common health problems really go across all um, uh, systems, cardiac, lung, metabolic. And because HIV crosses the blood-brain barrier, there are significant neurological effects, particularly those for those with early severe disease, that can lead to neurocognitive delays and deficits that youth must contend with for their entire life. What do we know psychosocially? The literature is starting to emerge from high-resource countries with long-standing access to art and the sizable numbers of adolescents born with HIV. In the interest of time, I'm going to talk about three multi-site longitudinal cohort studies from across the US, 
All three are funded by different agencies at NIH and include data from behavioral interviews with perinatally infected youth who were in older childhood or adolescence at baseline. There are also control groups, but I'm going to just uh, focus on the infected youth today. And I'm going to focus on four variables adolescent researchers are concerned with, mental health, sex, substance use, and adherence to treatment. So the first uh, graph is on psychiatric disorder. I want you to first focus on the dark blue. This represents the percentage of youth who met criteria for a psychiatric disorder, with 39 to 40 percent of youth meeting criteria primarily for anxiety and behavioral disorders. Without question, this is a challenge for all of us providing care to this population. But now I want you to look at the light blue. This is rarely looked at. These are the youth who, despite exposure to all those stressors I showed you before, are not presenting with disorder. In fact, they represent the minority. And if you compare them to the yellow, which is a U.S. nationwide study of over 10,000 youth from the general population, they look pretty similar. This point is hit home even more strongly with substance use. Um, in which the vast majority, if you look at the dark blue on the left, the vast majority of youth did not start experimenting with substances in early adolescence in spite of significant risk in their environments. And while it increases with age, if you look to the right over there, um, it is not nearly as much as youth in, the, in a U.S. national school-based study of over 15,000 youth in the general population. So again, we know very little about, about the light blue in both those areas, and I think we need to understand more. This is a sexual risk behavior, um, in two, well, sexual behavior. In two studies, um, we looked at uh, sexual data using an ACASI to reduce social desirability. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the vast majority of youth um, are not yet engaged in sexual activity, although I guess about half of them are beginning to, but not nearly at the rates that um, youth are in other places. And if you look at the right side of the slide there, 26% um, of the youth reported that they did not use a condom the last time they had sex. Now, none of us want to hear that a quarter of our patients are not using condoms, but if you compare them to the yellow, which is a national study, you can see that they are not doing it at any rate different from same age peers not coping with HIV. And finally is adherence. This is the biggest challenge to uh, providers across the country. And rightly so, where by the time they're in older adolescents, 50 to 60 percent of the youth um, are not taking their pills or reporting not taking their pills in the past month. But if we compare them to a range of kids with chronic health conditions, as shown by the yellow, again, it's very similar. In other words, adherence is a very difficult task for everyone. So the bottom line is if you look at the dark blue in all of these pictures, this is risk, and in, these kids are in need of intervention, but there's also considerable light blue or resilience that we need to pay attention to. Um, internationally, there are not nearly as many studies. Studies started late. They use different measures. But if we compare our data now to studies from Africa and Asia and a few other places, you can see um, can I use the pointer here, using the red, that there are definitely rates of mental health problems, kids are engaged in sex and substance use and non-adherence, but not 100 percent. So many of these kids are also resilient moving forward. So what can we do to support a safe passage through adolescence? I think everybody in this room knows, and we've heard from our previous speakers, there's not one magic pill. But rather, there are a range of factors we need to pay attention to. All right, I'll try to go quickly. <laughs> range of factors we need to pay attention to. And what's important is it's not just about the adolescents here, but it's about the systems they're in, their families, their peers, the medical systems, um, and their environments. There are very few evidence-based interventions for this population, in spite of the fact that many countries are trying to roll out programs. I'm going to talk about two very quickly now, CHAMP Plus and SUBI. They each target different individual family or contextual factors shown to be associated with positive youth development in other populations. So CHAMP Plus is the first program. It's meant to promote art adherence and mental health and reduce sexual risk. It's based on the CHAMP program that you heard about from Dr. McKay. Its goal is very, sim very similar to CHAMP. We want to strengthen the adult protective shield, strengthen youth skills, and promote their self-esteem and mental health. The premise is what families need to do to prevent sexual risk behavior. They also need to do to promote adherence. Similar to CHAMP, the CHAMP Plus curriculum and materials are tailored to the specific context through collaborative work with community stakeholders. 
Uh, CHAMP Plus uses a very similar structure to CHAMP. Multiple family groups come together for 10 sessions. It's facilitated by a lay staff. The difference is that it's now clinic-based. Because of stigma in communities, the safe space for HIV-positive kids is to come, about, come together in a clinic. The use of lay staff makes this a low-resource um, intervention. In South Africa, um, they renamed the intervention VUCA, or Let's Wake Up. And you can see here the 10-session curriculum. In black are all the sessions that are the same as CHAMP, but in red are those that are specific to HIV-positive youth if, as they have to contend with a range of stressors. We've successfully piloted it in two hospitals in South Africa, and we currently have a large-scale trial going on right now. Just to give you a flavor, in Africa and Asia, it's taboo to talk about many of these topics, particularly sex. Um, and so this is the VUCA family. Um, we use cartoons to help families talk about this. Um, Temba is a 12-year-old boy. He's lost his mother to AIDS. He's moved in with his aunt and uncle, but he is um, having to deal with loss and bereavement. He learns he has HIV, and now he has to learn about adherence to medication. Like all 12 or 13-year-old boys, or many 12 or 13-year-old boys, he likes a girl, so he has to think about disclosure. And he has to deal with his identity now that he's learned he has HIV. So we have a lot of hope about VUCA. But we also know that many behavioral interventions do not have long-term effects. Adherence remains an elusive outcome and a major barrier to actualizing the full potential of medical advances. So this led to the beginnings of SUBI. How many of you have ever um, tried to go up against Fred. Fred came to me and he said, I think poverty is the major barrier to adherence, and I think an economic empowerment intervention improves adherence. Um, I thought economic inequalities really um, have been thought to influence access to treatment, but not daily adherence. Um, and I did try to protest a little bit, but I didn't get too far. Fred brought me to Uganda. You're going to hear about SUBI, so I'm not going to talk a lot about it right now, but this is an economic empowerment intervention for adolescents. He brought me to a lot of schools. And I got to see these families really coming together to learn about savings and loans and vocations that would help these youth have hope for the future. Um, you saw Fred's data about how successful it had been. He also took me to a bunch of clinics, and I got to listen to kids and families talk about how poverty really was the number one barrier to them being able to take their medicines. If they did not have food, they had to make choices about taking those medicines and feeling sick to the, their stomach. Their parents had to choose between school fees and, getting, and paying for a, uh, ART. And they had to choose between going to work or taking their kids to clinics. So that led to the development of SUBI plus adherence to promote adherence as well as promote mental health and reduce risk behavior. It's done through the family-based uh, asset building and promotion of education that SUBI provides. But we're also borrowing some of the adherence materials from VUCA to use in the clinics, and you heard about the large clinical trial from Fred. So to summarize, we have a rapidly emerging population of youth with perinatal HIV. They are living with the demands of a chronic stigmatized illness and dealing with many, many stressors and traversing the rocky terrain of adolescence. There's a pressing need for interventions that promote normative development and successful transition to adulthood under challenging circumstances. Interventions have to address individual, family, and contextual factors. And related to today, I've actually been convinced, whoops, I want to go back, convinced that financial stability of youth that gives them a future orientation and a future vision is really critical, and we've been ignoring it. We've been saying that's the context out there, but we need to bring it in. So perinatally infected youth, like every other young person their age, deserve a fair shot at playing the game or safari of life. It may seem like a big wall to climb. The question is not whether we can afford to invest in opportunities for these youth, but how we can possibly afford not to. And here is my village of collaborators. I have to thank them, and many of them are in this room today. So um, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Gertrude Nachigozi. Um, currently working with Rakai Health Sciences Program, a program that focuses improving public health through research. I'm going to talk about the role of economic strengthening on adherence to HIV care and treatment experiences drawn from Rakai. 
Uh, we all know that Sub-Saharan Africa has the biggest share of HIV. We host about two thirds of the global infection and about 70% of the new infections occur in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in 2012, about 7% of the Ugandan population was living with HIV. Um, with increased funding for HIV care and treatment, there has been an increase in uptake of HIV counseling and testing, but a challenge remains with keeping people in pro care programs. And the low uptake of HIV treatment among Ugandan children is still of concern. So we know that despite availability and proven efficacy of HIV care, many children living with HIV do not access care. And for those who enter care, non-adherence and retention in these programs is a big challenge. And we know that this leads to biologic failure, uh, drug resistance, and among the young population that are sexually active, HIV transmission is a problem. And the inability of the children or their caretakers to meet costs associated with utilization of HIV care and treatment has come up as a major barrier to keeping in care and treatment. Uh, we might say that, oh, most of this treatment is already funded. For example, PEPFA is funding um, HIV care and treatment provided in Rakai district, but there are still costs the patient has to meet in order to utilize these free services. Unfortunately, there is limited data on impact of economic strengthening on HIV care and treatment, and we are happy to have Fred work in Rakai district on the Suvi adherence study. So our main objective is to highlight the magnitude of non-use of HIV care services and the economic barriers to enrollment and adherence to treatment. So in our first aim, we assess the rates and factors associated with non-enrollment into care. And then in the second, we describe barriers to enrollment for and adherence to HIV care services in Rakai. I'll not repeat what John has already said, but Rakai Health Sciences Program is a collaboration between researchers at Johns Hopkins University, Columbia University, Makere University, and Uganda Virus Research Institute in Uganda. And we conduct population-based research on HIV, infectious diseases, reproductive health, and we also provide services including male circumcision for HIV prevention, HIV care and treatment, family planning, and treatment of sexually transmitted infections. That's where our Rakai is located. And that's a picture of the Rakai Health Sciences Program Research Center. And above, we show some of our activities, including laboratory, a theater for male circumcision, and data management and entry. So this data was drawn from the Rakai Community Cohort Study, which surveys between 12,000 and 14,000 people annually, um, 15 to 49 years of age, in about 40 to 50 communities. The HIV prevalence in this cohort is 11%, a lot bigger than the national prevalence. We also drew data from 17 Rakai Health Sciences clinics, which take care of about 7,000 HIV positive patients. But I need you to note that very few of these are children. Uh, we provided a host of services as listed, but note that no economic strengthening was supported in these clinics. So to look at non-enrollment uh, for HIV care, we reviewed data of HIV-positive patients who had received their HIV test results and were referred for care. We defined enrollment into HIV care as an HIV-positive person reporting to the clinic within six months of referral. We then determined the proportion of non-users of care by participant characteristics and estimated the prevalence risk ratios for non-use. 
Uh, overall, about 32% of participants who knew their positive HIV status and had been referred for free care did not utilize services. And we need to note that being younger was um, a bigger risk to non-use of care. So we have a problem with the young population. They are not utilizing HIV care services. So having looked at who was not utilizing care, we attempted to locate these individuals and find out why. So we successfully located 48 participants, and of these, um, 12 were children under 18 years. And for purposes of this presentation, we shall focus on the younger population and particularly look at economic barriers to seeking care. So we conducted in-depth interviews among um, assenting children uh, who had received their HIV diagnosis as in AIM-1 but had not enrolled for care. Uh, we transcribed, then translated the interviews into English and then analyzed the data using Atlas GI. So focusing on economic barriers from this younger population, uh, we have a, uh, these are the voices of the young people we interviewed regarding the barriers. So transport costs came up as a significant barrier. Uh, this is a 17-year-old who was enrolled in a boarding school, and he had this to say. So he had initially entered care, but later dropped out. Um, when contacted, he said, when I go to school, my guardian gives me little pocket money. This money was not going to be enough to cover my transport costs to the clinic. I gave up. So he had no problem obtaining permission from the teachers to go to the clinic, but money was the problem. Then we had a 15-year-old HIV positive living with caretakers. He had no, she had no parents. But these caretakers were not aware of her positive HIV status. She did not enroll into care at all. And she thought of telling them her status, but she knew this was not her parental home. She thought that when she discloses her status, they'll stop supporting her school because they would think they're wasting money. She was going to die anyway. And lastly, uh, when giving antiretroviral therapy, some of these drugs have dietary recommendations, and many patients have reported uh, having an increased appetite after starting antiretroviral therapy. So as a clinician, you sit at your desk and say, make sure you take plenty of this before you take the medications. But these patients may not be able to afford food. So this is a 16-year-old out of school who had initially started antiretroviral therapy, but defaulted. And he said, our drugs, these are the antiretroviral drugs, require us to take food, but sometimes we don't have the money to buy the food. I could not continue. So what do we conclude from this? We think we have a problem with utilization of HIV care among the young people. And economic challenges are coming out as a barrier to adherence to care and treatment. We think that economic strengthening for adolescents and their families could improve adherence to HIV care and treatment services. So we recommend that economic strengthening routinely be integrated in HIV care and treatment services so as to promote adherence. And although currently Rakai Health Sciences program does not support economic strengthening, we highly welcome collaboration um, on these services to ensure success program. We are glad that all our HIV clinics are participating in the SUBI adherence study. Uh, thank you very much for this time. Good morning. Um, 
I'm Dr. Kivumbi Apple, and I coordinate the Subi Adhering Study, which is one of the studies for FRED in Uganda. Um, and I'm going to talk about youth adherence to art in Sub-Saharan Africa, looking at the Subi Adhering Study specifically. Um, so I'll start with, by giving a few brief statistics about HIV which some of them have been said. Um, around 35 million people living with HIV around the world, and around two-thirds of these are in Afri sub sub Saharan Africa. That's 25 million. And Uganda has around 1.5 million of those. And of those in Uganda, around um, 190,000 are children less than the age of 15. Um, so uh, we're going to look mainly at the adherence of these children on art, and adherence being defined as the extent to which, one, to which a person's behavior in terms of taking medication, following a diet, and executing lifestyle changes follows agreed recommendations from their health care providers. And, f and art has one of the highest percentages of adherence in order for you to achieve the desired results of art, that is optimal viral suppression and improvement on, in your immune system, you have to adhere at least 95%. You will have to take your medication at that rate. It's one of the highest, higher than most, most chronic diseases. And studies in Uganda have shown the adherence rate to be quite low at 66% comparing to the desired 95%. And the reason for this among us, the youths in Uganda are quite vast. Some of them are patient factors. Despite Uganda being at the forefront of fighting HIV and AIDS in the early 1990s and 2000s, there's still widespread stigma among us, the population um, to the extent that one leaves a unit that is close to their home and they travel over 100 kilometers to go and take medication, leaving a unit that provides care which is just five kilometers away from home. That's the extent of, the, of stigma um, within Uganda. And like, my, like Gertrude has said, still many of these, they don't want to disclose their status. And because of that, they leave the communities in which they live to go and access art from communities that far away. Um, children or youths in Uganda suffer from guilt and ignorance. And just to mention, most of these currently are the result of vertical transmission. Um, interventions that were aimed at preventing mother-to-child transmissions came late in Africa. And as such, we have many youths between the ages of 10 and 19 currently positive, but as a result of vertical, transmi vertical transmission. Then we have patient provider relationships. Um, many, uh, you find that there are few caretakers and so many patients. So uh, these care providers don't have time to give to these youths and youths or adolescents, they really do need to take time. You, need, you really need to take time with them talk to them so that they get friend you have to get friendly with them but most of these people they don't have time for them so youths just come pick their meds and go so you don't know what's going on in their life simply because you don't have time um, then you have regiment based characteristics pill burdens um, some some people take so many pills although the current recommendations say that you take at least one pill a day but some still take the older regiments where you take three in the morning, three in the evening, and that's a lot of pills in there. Food restrictions, people eat once, have one meal. Most families have one meal a day, but you're taking meds uh, which, where you're supposed to have food before, in the morning and the evening, but you're having one meal a day. So this um, puts a challenge on their medication. Then their healthcare system, their healthcare system problems, location of health units, some are very distant. You find a radius of around 25 kilometers having one health unit. Um, 
So why economic strengthening for youth infected with HIV? Why we think it's, it's, um, it will make a difference? In one of the reports, um, where they are looking at effect of economic empowerment on health outcomes, uh, they concluded that when you when you empower these youths economically, they will they will delay to going to child labor. They will stay in school. Um, they will look, they will have a positive attitude towards the future, and they will be able to access. Most importantly, they will be able to access their medical treatment and food supplements, which are all part of their care. Um, and currently, in the region where we work. That's Rakai and surrounding districts. Currently, there are a couple of programs that look at economic strengthening, but none of these look at youth specifically. I took only two, example, two examples, um, the saving and income loaning communities. That's a program for one of the units we work with, which is Vera Maria. They target communities, but mainly children, and the SIPS program for Uganda Cares. So we had here in six to seek to, to fill that gap of youth economic empowerment. Now the Soviet adherence design, we are looking at youths that are a number of 736, and our overall purpose is to increase or support at for low income HIV positive youths and promote income generating, generating activities for these youths and their families. And we're looking at children that are 10 to 16 years on art and away of their status, registered in one of the 40 units we're working with and living within a family that is broadly defined, not necessarily your mother, but an extended family, and, not as, and we, don't want, um, we don't take in youths that are living within institutions. And we are going to be monitoring, we are monitoring their art intake, and we are using four methods, that's self-reports, pill count, uh, use of biomarkers, that's the CD4 and the viral loads, as well as re using real-time monitoring system, otherwise pill. Uh, it sends a signal every time you open it, so we interpret that as you've opened that device to take your med medication. And our design is such that all these youths receive um, adherence monitoring and we map uh, the health unit and the youth's home location and compare the distances as well. Uh, for control, we shall give them literature about adherence and give they continue with the standard care. But for the intervention, we open child development accounts with matching cap of around approximately $10 per month. So you deposit $10, we, we also deposit $10. We give mentorship session, sessions and we use, um, we use college students and hospital staff to help us with that and also income generating activities. And that will be for the intervention arm. Then so far we've, we've, we've had a turn up of around 857, but we've, been, we've recruited 610. Um, but the main reason for not in registering these youths is most of them have not been disclosed to. So you're 12 years but your parent has not told you why you take your medication and they give all sorts of reasons, like you're taking this medication, it will make you bright in class, you'll be top of your class, or you have a liver disease, they never tell them the truth. And that's why we, um, we have, we've had a high turn up, but we've recruited less. Um, so the sample characteristics so far, 86.3% uh, are in school, 12% uh, dropped out of school and 1.2% were never in school. Um, and around 65.1% are orphaned, either single or double orphaned. And only 34% are not orphaned. But uh, looking at the viral loads, most of 39% uh, only had the desirable outcome of art treatment, that is, undetectable viral loads. The rest had significant viral loads and almost half of that are on second line treatment. And second line treatment is it's quite expensive and and stretching to, to, to the government as well as the funders. So we want most of them to stay on first line, but with the current trends, most of them are being enrolled onto second line. 
and in their own words, uh, one child had to say that I had to leave school since my fellow students were laughing at me because I had HIV and a skin condition. This child had Veruca planus, um, and she had to leave school, and the mother had to take her to a school that is far away, and that all increased cost because the child had to leave school to come and take their meds. And the mother who hadn't disclosed to her 14-year-old daughter, she was a single mom and had only one child, but feared that she would lose her child if she told the child that she was positive because of her. And as such, the mother had refused to tell her, to tell the child why the child was taking medication. I told the child they were taking medications for because of liver, liver problems. And then one teenager said, when I first started taking ARVs, I learned that I had to take them with food, else I'd become nauseous. They, they also made my appetite too high and I felt hungry all the time. I tried to eat more than usual, but the hunger I felt during that time was too much. I just didn't have enough food to satisfy my hunger, so I stopped taking my medication. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for two to three questions. Maybe we can just collect them. Um, so if you have one, can you raise your hand now? I've been, um, I should preface this by saying that I'm n I don't work in this area at all, so this is all really fascinating to me. And I've been struck by how often just food and hunger comes up as a reason um, for non-adherence. And I wondered if, um, there are interventions out there that provide not only the medication but also food um, as a way to increase adherence or if that's something that anyone has thought about to, to sort of link medication with food as part of the part of the intervention. Thank you. Um, um, Ebo Mwemez and I work with the with intervention programs. Yes, in Uganda there is one organization called TASO, the aid support organization. Um, it provides um, handouts in terms of food to its patients, but this is also very limited. One of the challenges we have as intervention programs, most funders don't want to fund economic empowerment. Uh, when we put it in our proposals, in intervention proposals, they are not interested. Um, we have attempted on several occasions to include IGS for these families and children in particular. They say, no, that's part of government. We don't want this because it's not sustainable. And of course, it's expensive, we can understand. It is very expensive. So they shy away from it. So my challenge to you, researchers, how much can you inform policymakers and funding agencies to get them interested in funding economic empowerment. Most of them are not interested. If you talk about sensitization, you talk about HIV testing, you talk about ARVs, you talk about uh, social uh, counseling and all that, they are interested. But you bring in economic empowerment, they shy away. True, policy. We have had wonderful presentations here. John, uh, is it, yes, he made a very wonderful presentation on education and HIV. Beautiful. But how much do policymakers and leaders and government know about this? Many of them don't. And really, uh, education to us who are intervention programs, we call it a, it is a, a family planning peer because it makes children delay, particularly girls, to go into policing children. It's a peer for poverty, as he put it, all that. But our governments, really, I don't know whether they link education to, or to, to, or to health, and how much has research institutions uh, popularized these statements to policymakers and government to link education to health? So my appeal to you is, how do we interest funders to supporting economic empowerment? There are very few. Food, very difficult to provide. There are very many children, orphans, who are on ARVs, 
Where will you get all this food to give them? No way, unless you do economic empowerment. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so um, maybe I don't know if you have a, a few words. I think in the interest of time, if it's okay, we're gonna move ahead, um, and then we can do more questions at the at the break and over lunch because um, we're just we're a little behind. Um, but if if anyone has a final word on the topic of food or um, policymakers, maybe you can quickly hear from you. I think those are great points and a great question. And I, um, I'm new in some ways to this area, but I think that in part, um, and I'm a psychologist, so maybe that, Mary McKay says that's always part of the problem. Um, <laughs> I think that many of our interventions around adherence and around healthcare have been very individually focused. And then when we move beyond the individual and move to partners or support systems or family, and I think that's really important, but I think we lost the context, or it felt so overwhelming that we couldn't get to it. And economics is one of those, and finances. But I think as we really um, increasingly realize that our interventions are only going so far, and they many of them are sitting on a shelf, people are actually getting much more willing. And I think funders are also. Our funder walked out for a little bit, but she came back in. Um, I think they are much more willing to look at structural factors that are really underlying a lot of this behavior. So I think, um, for example, Lucy Kluver and I were at a meeting last year with UNICEF where there's a huge focus on cash transfers. And my experience at NIH actually is there is more interest now in really trying to think about how to bolster um, uh, basic living needs that help people actually engage in behaviors that promote their health. So I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think we're going there. I, I mean, I want to reiterate what Dr. Mellon said. I think it's also, I know we're talking about Sub-Saharan Africa, but I think we can also think about what the epidemic looks like in the United States right now. And we think about young black men who have sex with men as being the group that is not only the most impacted, but the only group where we're seeing new infections increasing. And the uh, recent meta-analysis that came out two years ago that showed that there's no correlation between um, behavior and infection. And the things that are driving the epidemic are poverty, lack of education, unemployment, a history of car incarceration, which are all structural factors and really speak to the importance of focusing on context, and then also um, childhood, sexual abuse, childhood sexual abuse, and so really thinking about how to help young people who are also living in environments um, uh, that are not safe and healthy for them. So I'm excited that, um, to hear that NIH is moving towards that because the context is incredibly important. <laughs> 